Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to do my fourth data update for my 2018 data. And in this update, I want to focus in on what I think is one of the most mangled and misunderstood concepts in valuation and corporate finance, which is currencies. Let's face it, we're incredibly casual about the way we deal with currencies. Partly that reflects our history. Until a couple of decades ago, you could afford to stay focused on your local currency and not, never have to think about a currency outside of your borders. And we still tend to think of a particular number in a currency of our choice. Put differently, if you grew up in the U.S. and you work in the U.S., you tend to think in U.S. dollars. It is natural. If you tend to live and work in Indonesia, you tend to think in rupiah. It's not your fault. So when I ask you for a growth rate in a company, you tend to give it to me in the currency that you think in. And that can create problems. In this session, I'd like to focus on how to deal with different currencies and how to get comfortable working across different currencies. So let's start off by looking at three big misconceptions about currencies that can drive analyses off the rocks. Here's the first misconception. If I ask you to get a risk-free rate, use the government bond rate as a risk-free rate. And who can blame you? I know how I was taught risk-free rates in my MBA program. That was a long, long time ago. I was told to use the U.S. Treasury rate as my risk-free rate. End of the story. Shows you how dollar-centric my MBA classes were. But the assumption there was, if the U.S. Treasury is issuing something, it's default-free. Why? Because governments don't default. And if you ask proponents why this is true, they back it up with a very simple and perhaps persuasive statement, which is, when governments issue bonds in the local currency, the Indian government in rupees, the Indonesian government in rupiah, the U.S. government in dollars, it doesn't have to default. Why? Because it controls the printing presses. It can print more money. So you're saying, why would a government ever default in the local currency? Therefore, let's use the government bond rate in the local currency as the risk-free rate. Here's why you have to be cautious. While it may make sense that governments should never default in the local currency because they can print more money, the facts fly in the face of that statement. And here's why. If you look at the period in 1996 and 2012, out of the 58 sovereign defaults that happened during the period, 31 were local currency defaults. Governments chose to default on their local currency bonds. You think, why would they do that? Why, if they can print more money, would they ever default on the debt? The answer, again, is if you print more money, you may pay off your debt, but you debase your currency. Nobody wants to use your currency. They don't trust your currency anymore. And given the choice between debasing your currency and defaulting, governments often choose to default. It seems to be easier to come back from default than debasement. Whatever the reason, the assumption that the government bond rate is risk-free is a dangerous one. Many government bond rates have default risk in them, and using them as risk-free rates can end up in double counting. You're saying, what kind of double counting? Well, if I use the government bond rate as a risk-free rate, and that government bond rate happens to have default risk in it, let's say the Nigerian Naira, the government bond rate in January 1st, 2018 was 14.12%. If I use that as my risk-free rate, and then I build on top of that a beta and an equity risk premium, and let's face it, when I get to an equity risk premium for Nigeria, I'm going to use a big number. Why? Because it's a Nigerian company. I am double counting risk, once through my risk premium, and once through what I call my risk-free rate, which is the 14.12%, but was really not default-free. So in a sense, using the government bond rate as a risk-free rate sets, up, sets us up for double counting of risk, which means that if we want to work in local currencies, we have to clean up the government bond rate if that is the number we're going to start with. You're saying clean up for what? For the default risk that's embedded in the bond. You're saying how would I do that? The answer is actually surprisingly simple. You have to come up with an estimate of the default spread for your country, right? And there are three ways you can get that default spread. One is if your country has issued bonds in U.S. dollars or euros, many, many Latin American countries, for instance, issue bonds in U.S. dollars, you can compare the rate on a U.S. dollar denominated bond issued by your government to the T-bond rate. Remember, you can always compare bonds in the same currency. So the Brazilian government 10-year bond is trading at 5.5% and the U.S. T-bond is trading at 2.5%. The default spread is 3%, the difference between the two rates. That's the first way. But to use that, you need either dollar or euro denominated bonds. Here's the second way. If you have a sovereign CDS traded on your country, 
You're saying, what's a sovereign CDS? It's insurance against a false spread you can buy in the marketplace. You can actually buy that insurance for about 65 countries. You're getting an estimate of the default spread for your country. That number for Brazil at the start of 2018, for instance, was 2.5%. For Nigeria, it was 4.5%. So basically, depending on the country, you can get a sovereign CDS spread, perhaps as a measure of the default spread. There's a third way that you can use as long as your country has a local currency rating. From whom? Moody's, S&P, Fitch. If you have a local currency rating for your country, I can estimate the default spread that goes with your rating. I have a lookup table I update once every six months where I look at the sovereign ratings and I look at traded bonds or sovereign CDS spreads with countries with that rating and try to come up with an estimate of what the typical default spread is for a rating. So if you tell me your rating as a country, let's say it's B2, I'll come back to you and say your default spread is 5.5% or 5.6% and that number is going to be the default spread you take out of the government bond. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start the, the, with the government bond rate, but rather than assume it's, ref, it's a risk-free rate, I'm going to me, make it my starting rate. I'm going to estimate the default spread, net that spread out from the government bond rate, come up with a risk-free rate in a currency. Now let's take a look at what this delivers across currencies at the start of 2018. So if you look at this chart, there are about 45 currencies on this chart. Why only 45? I could find only 45 currencies with a 10-year government bond in the local currency. Remember, many governments don't issue 10-year bonds or they borrow money, they borrow from the World Bank. For these 45 currencies, I did what I just described. I started with the government bond rate and netted out the default spread. You see the default spreads by ratings class in the table in the graph. So if you're a AAA rated country, I take the government bond rate as a risk free rate. So it's just franc the US dollar. If you're not AAA rated, I start with the government bond rate and I net out the default spread. For the euro, I use the German euro bond rate as my risk-free rate. Not the Spanish, not the Portuguese, not the Italian. Why? Because the German government is, the tr is AAA rated and is perhaps the safest of the EU countries. So there you go. You've got risk-free rates in different currencies. Now you're saying, what next? Here comes the second misconception. I've heard people talk about a global risk-free rate. And I'm always puzzled. I'm not sure what a global risk-free rate is because risk-free rates don't go with geographies. They go with currencies. Analysts, of course, then say, well, the global risk-free rate is the lowest of the risk-free rates. No, they say because a lower rate is, less, is more risk-free than a higher rate. Well, that sounds reasonable until you think about it. If I use that argument then, the Swiss franc rate or the Croatian Kuna rate is my risk-free rate and every other currency is not a risk-free rate, it's a risky rate. That makes no sense. And here's why it makes no sense. Risk-free rates vary across currencies for a simple reason and it's not default risk. If I've done my job and these are truly risk-free, they vary across currencies for one reason and one reason alone. There are differences in expected inflation across currencies. High inflation currencies will have high risk-free rates. Low inflation currencies will have low risk-free rates. And that's both free and it's going to, to make evaluations much more consistent. Here's why. The first implication is you can't blend different risk-free rates. So if I give you Nestle and it gets cash flows in 70 currencies, you can't average the rates across those 70 currencies because what you get is mush. That would be the equivalent of my taking the temperature in New York and the temperature in Frankfurt, one stated in Fahrenheit, the other in Celsius, summing the two and dividing by two and say the average temperature across the two cities is X. Makes no sense. Or taking your weight in kilograms and taking your friend's weight in pounds, adding the two numbers and dividing by two. Wouldn't make any sense. When you have different currencies, you cannot blend rates. That's why if I take borrowing rates for a company that borrows in five different currencies and average them out, I am not getting a cost of debt for the company. I'm getting nonsense. The second implication is a more powerful one. If inflation is the only reason for differences in risk-free rates, then I should be able to get a risk-free rate in any currency if I can get the expected inflation rate in that currency. And here's why. If I have a T-bond rate, I know the risk-free rate in US dollars, and I have a sense of what the expected inflation is in US dollars, let's say it's 1.75%, and you come to me with the Indian rupee and say, what's my risk-free rate? I'm just gonna ask you one question. What's the expected inflation in India? Now, you might give me last year's inflation because that's all you have, but let's say it's 
6% minus 1.75% is 4.25%, right? That's a differential inflation. If I wanted an approximate risk-free rate for India, I'm going to add that 4.25% to the 2.41% risk-free rate in US dollars. I get 6.66% as my risk-free rate in Indian rupees. If I want a precise answer, there's a compounding effect. I take 1 plus the US risk-free rate. You know, it sounds fancy, but hang in there with me. It'll be 1.0241. And I use 1 plus the inflation rate in, in the Indian rupee, 1.06, divided by 1 plus the inflation rate in US dollars. I can actually get a more precise number. That precise, more precise number is 6.68%. It's like all that work for 0.02%. The higher inflation becomes, the more important that you use the full equation because it'll give you a better answer. So inflation rates can be used to get different risk-free rates. Incidentally, if you link to one of the data sets I have at the end of this, um, the, 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 this, this session, I have risk-free rates in about 200 currencies uh, using the differential inflation approach. Far more currencies, and you also don't have to deal with the stuff of is the government bond rate traded, is the rate set. For instance, in the, in the government bond rate chart, you saw the Venezuelan Bolivar's risk-free rate at less than 10%. Do you really believe that? I think it's because the government bond rate, like much in Venezuela, is not a market set rate. So if you ask me what the risk-free rate in Venezuelan Bolivar is, my guess is it's several thousand percent. Why? Because the inflation rate is several thousand percent. Third misconception, and this, this actually is going to be dispelled as soon as you think about how we dealt with the second one. Many analysts spend days, hours, weeks trying to figure out what currency to value a company. And so if I gave you several stars, you're saying, should I value it in US dollars? Should I value it in euros? Should I value it in Russian rubles? And my answer to you is, don't worry, just pick a currency and do it right. What do I mean by that? Currency choice should not affect your valuation. You say, how can it not? If I estimate my, my discount rate in Swiss francs, I will get a lower discount rate than if I estimate it in Russian rubles. You're absolutely right. You will get a lower cost of capital, lower discount rate if you use a lower inflation rate currency. That's absolutely true. But you'll also get lower growth rates and lower cash flows. In fact, if you do it right, you should end up with the same value for your company, no matter what currency value, value it in. Because whatever one hand gives you, with either higher growth, the other hand will take away with a higher discount rate. To do this though, you have to be careful. If I ask you for a growth rate in cash flows and you give me a growth rate in rupees and I never bother to check, and I use the growth rate in in discount in, in estimating my cash flows, but I then proceed to discount at a dollar discount rate, I'm going to get an overvaluation of your company. Also, when I use exchange rates, if I follow the differential in, uh, inflation rule, the way I estimate inflation rates has to be consistent with that difference in inflation. I have to use purchasing power parity. And to me, this is an extremely comfortable equation because it basically means that when I value a company, I have to pick a currency and do it right, not spend my time obsessing about the currency. Now, of course, whenever I say this, I get a pushback. I get a pushback from people saying, well, what if I expect the RI or the repeat to appreciate over the next five years, even though inflation in these currencies is higher and they should appreciate? No, you're right. You have a currency view. If you push that currency view into the valuation, you are going to push up the value of your company. You're going to ask me to buy your company. But then I'm going to ask you why you found this company to be cheap. It's not because you like the company, but because you felt the REI or the repeat would appreciate, right? If that is your calling card, that you think exchange rates are going to change in a particular direction, you have a view on exchange rates, there are far simpler and easier ways for you to make money. Why would you want to use the company as a vehicle? So my suggestion is if you have currency views, give them to me separately. But in your valuation, stick to what I suggested. Use purchasing power parity. Remember differential inflation rules. Try to make your valuation currency in a currency consistent. And that will basically mean you'll get the same value no matter what currency you pick. So in conclusion, I think it's time we were we we, we it's time we, we, we should really stop being casual about our use of currencies. So when I talk about exchange rates, and you should put me on the spot, so when I say 12% growth rate, I should almost always specify the currency in which I'm doing that growth rate in. When we talk to each other, as analysts often across borders, who often deal in different currencies, we have to make it a point to be explicit about the currencies that we're talking about. If not, we're asking for a world of trouble. Thank you very much for listening.